Hey, Ronnie Dahl, Four Wheeling Australia. Welcome to a video where I'm going to share with you all of my experience with tips and advice for towing off-road. There is a lot more to it than what people may think. Towing on the highway is one thing. Towing out in the bush is an entirely different beast. Towing on sand, towing on sand dunes, brake controllers, lowering tires, why? So many questions. So many answers coming your way right now. Another bit of advice here. If you have someone who's towing in the convoy, make sure they're not the last vehicle in the convoy because then people can see if there's anything missing, anything open, or anything falling off the trailer. It's a bit hard to see when you're the driver. So if you can, make sure whoever's towing is not the last vehicle in the convoy. There's a good reason that the towing vehicle is never at the back. Um, I don't know how long I've been driving, but Wayne's behind me and he's just called out to say that uh, I've lost a tyre. I had no idea in the cab. I can't feel it. I can't see it because it's the same width as the track. Here's another tip for you. When you are reversing your trailer and you're setting up for camp, you can go to low range. So if you're off-road, low range is fine because you're in low four-wheel drive. But is an added bonus. See, the whole reason for low range is so you can go slow controlled. You don't have to use your clutch. You just let the vehicle idle and you just concentrate on steering, your brakes and your acceleration. Don't worry about the clutch until you've got the trailer where you want it. The added bonus is you, you can also do this on road because all you have to do if you have manual locking hubs, flick it to free, and now you have two wheel drive low range. Now if you have a vehicle that does not have manual locking hubs, you can do a modification which I have done on a previous vehicle and you need to intercept the signal that tells the vehicle to put it into four wheel drive. If you can cut that signal with a switch and now you have two wheel drive low, just like a manual locking hub vehicle. Another super important thing, when lowering your tires on your vehicle, don't just lower the fronts and the backs, you also need to lower the tires on your trailer. And here's why. When we lower our pressures on our vehicles, we're doing it for a number of reasons, not just to get more traction. So we increase the footprint, the length of the footprint. That gives us more traction, but it also gives us flotation on sand. It also gives us the extra cushioning or more suspension, shock absorbing as well. It does a lot when you lower your tire pressures. So the same thing should be done to the trailers. And a lot of people don't do this. And a lot of people don't know why they should do it. Well, it's the same reason. We're not trying to get more traction with the, with the trailer because the, the trailer's got no drive. It's just being dragged, towed. The reason why we lower the pressure on the trailer is to keep our cargo safe, to keep the trailer on top of the sand, on soft sand. If we are dragging this trailer up over sand dunes and whatnot, you've got your tires down on the vehicle. If you don't put these down, this is going to be jumping around and, and actually corrugating the sand dune, corrugating the sand tracks. You're actually damaging the sand tracks and the tracks by not lowering the tire pressure. And more importantly, well, just as importantly, all the gear in your, in your trailer is gonna get a lot less smashed around if you lower the pressure on your tires. So I guess the next question is, what pressure should you go down to? It all depends on your trailer as well. This is a fairly light trailer. We're talking 650 kilos dry, loaded, well under a ton. If I'm going on the sand, I could have this tire to, from about eight PSI to five PSI. Yes, I know that sounds really low, but that's what I do and it goes fine. When I'm on clay tracks, we're talking 15, to 12 psi gravel roads like what i'm traveling on now here in the pilbara on the way back to perth we're probably talking 20 psi no more than 25 my normal road pressure on this trailer 30 psi now on my vehicle on sand i'll go 12 and 14 clay we're talking high 20s gravel roads we're talking mid 30s so that gives you an idea that 
you need to take a lot more out of your trailer generally than you do out in your vehicle because there is a lot less weight here and this doesn't need to drive either. Plus, you're not turning your trailer wheels so the risk of these popping off the beat is very minimal. So you can get away with eight to five PSI on the beach, but just depending on how much weight you have in the trailer. When possible, run the same tire size, the same rim size, the same rim offset, the same stud pattern on the trailer. So it's the same as a vehicle. Because if you do that, essentially, you got more spare tires. So let me give you an example. We just came back from Kananara and on a full drive trip. Now I blew that tire, I only brought one spare. The thing was, I wasn't too worried because I still had another two spare on the trailer. You blow your tires on the vehicle, you can steal the tires from your trailer, leave your trailer behind and get yourself safely back to civilization where you can regroup and head back in and then grab your trailer. One of the most important things to know about your trailer is your jackknife points. That is mine. It'll be different for every trailer that you tow, but uh, that's how far I can go on this one. On my military trailer, I can go a lot further than that. That's about as far as we're going to get it. That's, uh, that's beyond 90 degrees there. That's beyond 90 degrees. But it's good to know. So if you have a long tray, you may not be able to go this far with yours. You may actually contact down the bottom where the drawbar is. You may actually stretch the cables. Those are all the things that you need to find out before you head off road. Sometimes going one way you can go this far, the other side you can't go that far, perhaps because your cables aren't long enough or your chains. So all those things are good to know. You will find, however, though, that your mates will be screaming at you to stop. But that's because they don't know how far you can jackknife your trailer. It's actually quite funny. All these experienced enough. Yeah. No, don't go that way, Ronnie. Don't do that. Don't do that. Ah. Is he going to... Okay. Yeah. Some people go, go whack them back real and they bend all the back of their car, oh, right? Yeah. You know? Yep. Whoop. Sweet as when hooking up your trailer and someone else has done it for you, if you're the one towing. Make sure you get out and you check it out. So here's a perfect example. I left the jockey wheel down. I also did the chains the opposite way that Torbs locks his chains. Now I like them crossed over as well, but as an example, I've done them straight over. So when someone else hooks your trailer up, it's all good and well people helping you out, you need to get out and make sure it is done exactly the way you like it and it's all secure because at the end of the day, you're the one towing a trailer, so if something happens, you're the responsible one. It doesn't matter who hooked it up for you, it all comes back on you. Now we're sweet. Do me sharp trailer? Yes, please. This is called the double check. When you travel with someone, especially if you have a passenger, and you're closing up your trailer, always do the double check, the round check. Now, I've already hooked the trailer up to the way I like it, so that's all good. I know that's all done. Torbs has just shut the trailer up, but I want to go check and make sure that everything is hunky-dory. It's up to how I like it. Everything is shut properly. All good, but he's left the wire out, so that's going to let dust in. Get that wire in. Latch undone here. Now obviously this is worst case scenario stuff, but it does happen, it ha and it has happened. So here's another latch. This is a common one for me. The boys forget to do that. And sometimes they even forget to shut those. 
Double check is complete. Spare bits and bobs. What do I mean by that? Trailer connector. It's good to have a spare one. Also good to have an adapter. You may not need an adapter, but what if all of a sudden your vehicle's incapable of towing or something's happened to your vehicle or something's happened to your tow assembly? Cracked on both sides. Cracked at the receiver on the top, on the gussets, on the sides. So it's cracked in one, two, three, four, five places. Your mate can now tow because most people either have the flat or the round. Always carry one of these opposite to what you actually need. It's also a good idea, see if I can find it, to have another pin for, you know, this is a small pin for the big pin that holds the trailer tongue in. It's important to have a spare one of these. If you're on the beach and you're mucking around and you're like, okay, we've got base camp, you put one of these in so you can snatch your mates out. Recovery hitch. What happens if you drop this in the sand? Things can get lost real easy. Keep a spare one. Packing your trailer for off-road, you gotta make sure everything is packed nice and tight and you got soft bits in between fragile bits. You're packing for off-road, not the highway here. So you don't want cans busting or bags ripping, things like that. You wanna really jam it in properly. You wanna play like a, a good game of Tetris. It's probably a good way of putting it. So behind this box, this is so secure. Behind that, I've got two other boxes. They just fit in and everything is really jammed in. So things can't really move around too much. Where does glass? I've wrapped it in things like towels, clothing, just anything you, you can find get your hands on just wrap it up in it here's another good example there's my drone case obviously fragile stuff in there nice and safe now I'll put the case in between two soft bags so this has got soft goods in it that's got soft goods clothing tools but it, you can see how I've jammed it in it's not moving around much at all so it's not going to rub on anything over here I have an inverter which is charging some batteries now that is also secure, that's not going to move around either because you don't want electrical stuff rubbing around and moving and possibly plugs coming out and whatnot. So really jam your stuff in, think about it and you should be right. And this can probably shouldn't be there either. When looking for off-road trailers, be very careful. Try and stick clear of the cheap Chinese gear because it's fine on the highway, but when you go off-road, you go corrugations for 500 kilometers at a time, they're probably gonna break down. Now, with, in our experience, we've seen plenty of trailers out there. Great Central Road, we saw, oh, I don't wanna mention the brand names here because that's probably not fair, but we've seen some cheaper version of trailers, the hub failure, uh, others burnt down. We've seen heaps. Now, trailers I've towed in the past, there has been one particular one that didn't tow so well. It was set up way too rigid and it was too light for the rigidness of the actual suspension. We broke beers, we broke cargo, we broke food, we lost milk. It was, it was a bloody nightmare to be honest. I have towed some of their bigger trailers and they tow bloody good. So make sure that the trailer you are looking for suits what you are actually going to do. So if you're going to do a lot of off-road stuff, you're going to need a proper off-road trailer. Now there are many makes and models uh, not just this one, but that is a particularly good one for off-road. The army trailer is actually pretty good too, and that's on leaf suspension. I'll pull a few leaves out, soften it up, that tows beautifully. If you have a leaf sprung trailer, just make sure it's not too rigid. Coil suspension off-road trailers versus leaf sprung off-road trailers. They are both fine, believe it or not. Obviously a coil is always better, because you don't have that axle in the middle, so you do have more clearance, and it's a softer ride when you're off-road. Now you can get airbag suspension as well, they're even better again, but let's just stick to coil and leaf because that's what most people have, have or can afford. Leaf sprung, as I mentioned earlier, as long as it's soft enough, if it's too rigid, it's not good. If it's soft, it's good. If you hit things too hard off-road and it's too stiff, your cargo is gonna suffer, the leaves may break as well. You're gonna put a lot of stress and strain on your trailer. 
So make sure that the suspension is soft enough for it a bit. Now, if you have a very light trailer with a stiff suspension, you gotta put weight in it, because otherwise things aren't gonna end well for you. If you're a company that makes off-road trailers and you have leaf sprung trailers, for crying out loud, put some bloody shockies in it, will ya? Let's discuss brake controllers. Brake controllers are great off-road. And also, sometimes you need to switch them off. This one here is a Topro. It has a setting from zero to 10. I'll run you through the settings that I use on this. We'll start with sand. So sand, I always put it to zero. You do not want brakes on sand from the trailer because what will happen is, if you just slightly touch those brakes, the trailer will lock up. So in a vehicle, when you're coming down the beach and you want to come to a halt, never ever just jam the brakes on because what happens is when the vehicle stops, you're creating sand mounds in front of the wheels. So when you go to take off later, you may be in a bit of strife. You may end up getting bogged. So the best way to come to a halt on the beach is to gently apply the brakes and then let it coast to a stop. Now, the thing is, when you do gently apply those brakes, if your brake controller is on, the trailer's gonna try and lock up. On sand, I'll run my brake controller on zero especially going down sand dunes as well. The last thing you want is, a, is for the trailer to lock up and then maybe go sideways. You don't want that. It's the same when you're going down like a, a muddy, sloppy hill. You do not want your trailer to lock up and go sideways. So be careful with your settings on here. When I want the hard stuff, like the technical, hardcore, sort of full driving or like rock steps, I will set it almost to maximum. I'll set it to like between six and eight and I will actually push this button and use the brakes on the trailer to slowly negotiate down hills. So this is a manual vehicle. I can put it in first gear low and the trailer, the trailer's brakes will actually help me slow down a bit and take it a lot more gentler. So it's a pretty cool feature to use and have. On gravel roads, do not have it set too high because when you hit those brakes, that trailer's just gonna lock up and slide. That's something you do not want. So you need to probably get used to the adjustments on it and depending on how much weight you have on it, depending on your brakes as well, you want to sort of fill around and then work out exactly what you want to do. This is one of my favorite subjects to cover right here when it comes to towing. And that is with vehicles, they're not designed for off-road use. So where you have your trailer plugs and your Anderson plugs and all that, even installers, they put them underneath the tow bar, the tow bar assembly. That is the worst spot to put them. If you're on some technical departure angle stuff, for example, like a washout or a gully, these will get collected. They will get caught up in, in rocks, sticks, and that's how things break. And that's how lines get torn. So if you have yours underneath, which you more than likely do, relocate them on top of it, and then they'll be out of harm's way. For example, these are on the tray. Although they're underneath the tray, they're out of harm's way. This is never gonna contact the ground before this does. So that is a smart move. Put them on top, not underneath. Roger, coming back. Off-road trailer reversing tip take your seatbelt off because you can lean out the window and don't be scared to make heaps of small adjustments as you go just constantly because you got a lot to concentrate on especially on narrow tracks you gotta look for stakes bushes everything so frequent turns of the wheel can actually help a bit if you turn can turn around and come back here we're not going any further I've seen other people in the full drive industry, they are recommending that you do a cable tie crossways on your plugs. I think that is a bad move. It does a good job in holding it, but these connections to get a lot of dirt in them, so I would leave them loose. It'd be easier for you to check if there's dirt in it, because you always get dirt in these. If something does get caught up, you want it to actually pull off. You don't want the cables to pull off. If you put cable ties around and you secure this connection, if it gets caught up in something, 
it's going to snap the wires. So what you want it to do is to actually get caught and pull this out rather than the wires coming out and then perhaps contacting. Don't use cable ties in my opinion. One more important tip with towing trailers. Wheel chocks. So here's your conventional wheel chock. You can probably barely see it because it's right wedged in there. But that's your super cheap auto wheel chocks. I think that's five bucks or 10 bucks. Don't rely on rocks and logs around everywhere. Have some wheel chocks in your vehicle or in the back of the trailer, like in a compartment like this, and you'll be sweet. You need them. Because we've had situations before where we're pulling drawers out, we're pulling stuff out, someone might be in a rooftop tent, and then all of a sudden the whole thing starts rolling. So trust me, wheel chocks, gotta have them. Apart from the wheel chocks, max tracks or recovery boards are also a good way to level out your trailer. Now these short ones I really like because you can use them as a jack base plate and they're a bit, they don't flex as much. So you can put them underneath your trailer to level it out. That's what I mainly use this for. And at home in the driveway, believe it or not, I use this to chock the trailer and even to chock my vehicle. So they're quite handy. It's a, you know, more than one use. If you have any extra stuff, put it down below and uh, yeah, give us a thumbs up if you learned something. Learn something new every day. We all do. All right, see you later. Well, hang on. Not so fast. Not so fast. Without you, I can't make more content. <laughs>